Ladies and gentlemen, I, I want to take this time now to qualify the area that we're going to be going into because this is where the significant amount of regulation lie. NASDAQ, 20 questions, 7. 10 on the first half and 10 on the second on direct participation programs. Total of 20. Significant area. I tell you how many and I tell you where. So listen carefully. Everything that we, I think, now discussed associated with the structure and the characteristics and the classes of partners and the documentation from the first segment is a prerequisite to this portion of the segment. And this is where we're really going to start to heat up. So brace yourself, okay? Okay. Thanks. Because I, okay? okay? I really needed that one. Now, I want to first talk about raising some capital. The general partner needs capital. There are many ways that that capital can be raised to uh, engage in these oil and gas and or real estate programs. One way, of course, is to contact investors who have been investing with him over the years, uh, where he has accumulated an investor profile of clients, limited partners that he's been successful uh, in managing their assets for and programs. Another way possibly on the 7 is to come down to Wall Street with the services of a broker-dealer and ask Goldman Sachs, if you will, just to use that firm as an example, uh, for financing in the form of a $25 million underwriting, possibly to bring him public. Are you with me so far? Yes. Or a private placement for a direct participation program, Reg D, offering memorandum to be issued and raising that money privately to investors. Well, the underwriting is really what's more important for the 7. The type of IPO, we talked about different types of underwritings on day one, which were firm commitment, best efforts, all and none, is minimum maximum. Series 7, it is a direct participation program, mini maxi DPP managed underwriting. Managed underwriting because the sponsor is going to give this capital raise over to Goldman Sachs. Lead underwriter here. Say, Goldman? You want to form a syndicate and invite six, seven, two, or three other investment bank broker dealers in the syndicate formation of the capital raise to raise capital for me, that's fine. But you're the lead guy on this deal, the lead manager to this underwriting. Only so far. Yes. Everything run through Goldman. And this is a managed offering. The type of IPO, minimum, maximum, in that the sponsor will tell Goldman, look, within the first six months we need of this $25 million underwriting, a minimum of $5 million to get started down there in Waco, Texas on the partnership property for the least expense for the industrial equipment or the hiring of the labor and the core analysis of the topography report uh, and in lieu of the residual, which is $20 million, representing the maximum of this, of this $25 million underwriting in a minimum, maximum type of IPO structure. If Goldman Sachs could not raise that minimum, Five million of that maximum $25 million underwriting within that six-month period of time canceled the underwriting. So most limited partnerships are structured in the form of a minimum, maximum DPP-managed underwriting. Are you with me so far? Yes. Type of IPO. Goldman Sachs agrees to do the underwriting. Are you with me so far? Yes. They go down to Waco, Texas. They perform investment banking due diligence. Uh, they spend $250,000 on legal expenses, the filing of the prospectus, red herrings, the attorney fees, blue sky fees, the printing costs associated with the preparation of the red herring and the final prospectus associated with the sale of this underwriting, $250,000 borne by Goldman Sachs. Now Goldman Sachs performs the underwriting. Are they so far? Yes. See, $25 million DPP mini maxi managed underwriting. The maximum underwriter compensation to Goldman Sachs as a result of their participation in this IPO is Series 7, as you see here, 10% of the gross dollar amount of security sold. This 10% of the gross dollar amount, which is $25 million, represents to Goldman Sachs $2.5 million. Agreed. Agreed. The question now becomes is the 10% of the gross dollar amount of security sold, this is NASDAQ now, inclusive or exclusive of any and all investment banking fees borne by the lead manager to, facil to facilitate the underwriting. And so that means, what about the additional $250,000 that Goldman Sachs spent as a result of their legal due diligence, printing costs associated with uh, expenses borne by this underwriting? Will that 10%, 2.5 million, to Goldman Sachs 
represent and include or exclude the $250,000 of investment banking fees. We have to hold a complete regulation. We have to know the complete answer. Are you with me so far? Yes. In Series 7, the compensation to the underwriter, the 10% of the gross dollar amount of security sold, Series 7 is inclusive of any and all investment banking fees borne by the underwriter to facilitate the sale. Goldman Sachs is not getting any more than 10% net, $2.5 million. That includes any fees that they might have spent associated with facilitating the cost of underwriting. Are you with me so far? It is net. Are you with me so far? Yes. Now, when we talk about the gross dollar amount of securities sold, you know we're raising $25 million here in the form of an underwriting. Am I right? Yes. But the proper qualification and terminology in trading on Wall Street for the security are limited partnership Series 7 interests, where each interest that's sold represents a million dollars per limited partner per interest for the sale of 25 interests for the raising of $25 million. They are not shares. Are you with me so far? They are limited partnership interests. Are you with me so far? Where each interest represents $1 million per limited partner interest uh, per investment. Are you with me so far? The yeah. sale of 25 interests and the raising of $25 million of investor capital. And so the managed offering on a maximum, mini-maxi basis is the way capital is underwritten and raised in the form of a public public offering for an IPO for limited partnerships for NASDAQ. And so now, I want you to know the limited partner is going to invest that money. General partner is going to raise that money in the form of $25 million, mini maxi basis. Are you with me so far? Yes. And the use of proceeds now is what's significant for the seven, what the limited partner is going to invest that $25 million in. And as you see here, there are many different types of programs. We begin with the real estate and move into the oil and gas. And then the further menu for today is to move into the tax ramifications of this tax shelter. And that's, I think, where the regulations really start to heat up. So, the first area of regulation is the different types of programs that we have. But the question now becomes, what does NASDAQ seek concerning these programs? And the answer is Series 7. They want something very specific, nowhere found in the body of the work. So listen to me carefully. The advantages and the disadvantages of investing in the various different programs. Seven, from the limited partner point of view. I give you the perspective as well, like I promised you when I met you. Are you with me? Yes. Not from the partnership, the entity's point of view. Not from the distorted perspective of corporations point of view. Are you with me so far? Yes. Not from the GP's point of view. There is only one correct perspective to view the advantages and the disadvantages of investing in the various different programs and that is from the limited partner point of view, the investor point of view. Now, uh, they are pretty much business common sense, but let's lay it out. We begin with the real estate. We begin with new construction. If you'll allow me, I promise you I will trade with you all of these program investments, just like every strategy. I'm going to take your $25 million right now. I'm going to go up the block, two and a half blocks from here to ground zero, and I'm going to build two new skyscrapers, new construction, in the form of a new construction real estate limited partnership program. Will you agree with me, limited partners, that before you can invest in these programs, a new construction real estate program investment, that this project, the building of this new skyscrapers, will take 10, 15, if not 20 years to complete. Say yes. yes. This is a long-term project. So, the limited partner and the investor is going to make building investment decisions based upon the nature of this particular project. Some of these decisions that you'll make are the long-term nature of this project. For example, you have to analyze the following factors. Series 7, bullet 1, the level of inflation. I'll tell you why this is part of the analysis uh, in a moment uh, to determine the advantages and the disadvantages of investing in this new construction real estate limited partnership program. We have to analyze the cost of labor, Series 7, Bullet 2. Series 7, Bullet 3, we have to analyze the concept when we are building in an area that's dense in geographic location of overbuilding. Overbuilding is a concept that needs to be evaluated from an investor point of view when you are investing money in a partnership that is building in an area specifically like the financial capital of the world where there's a lot going on. Are you with me so far? Yes. Overbuilding is a concept where the other areas of and projects of construction that are going on right where we're looking to build with your capital, ground zero, that could be detrimental to the completion of these new skyscrapers. Are you with me so far? Yes. It has to be analyzed that could affect the completion of your project. We take a look at the cost of Series 7 raw materials that is utilized to build this project. All of these factors must be analyzed uh, based upon not only today's levels, for those economic variables. But look at me. 
5, 10, 15 years out, Series 7 on a pro forma basis. Series 7 on a pro forma basis, uh, 5, 10, 15 years out, based upon the length of this project, because if those levels rise 5, 7 years out, and they're bound to and likely to, from today's analysis of those levels, when you decide to make this investment decision, well, then that's going to represent into the future higher costs as a, law, as a result of the erosion of inflation and higher building costs and labor costs. Uh, and that's going to Series 7 do what? Reduce your passive income and reduce your returns. So when you invest in a new construction real estate limited partnership program, those economic variables and their levels, not only to be an analyzed based upon today's levels, but on a pro forma basis five, seven years out, because they can affect your returns in the form of passive income. Are you with me so far? Yes. And I think you can see they make pure economic investment business sense on how it affects the returns. And the returns are expressed in the form of what? The passive income that the program distributes to you from its profits. Are you with me so far? Yes. But instead of taking your $25 million and going to ground zero and building two new skyscrapers, I have a greater plan. I'm going to take your $25 million, if you'll allow me, and I'm going to go right up the corner from right where we're sitting right now and buy 30 Broad Street. That's the building right on the corner. Are you with me so far? Yes. Why don't you come along with me right now and take a look at the building that your $25 million has just purchased. This is known as an existing property real estate limited partnership program, the second real estate partnership program on the real estate side. Now, if you come with me and just hang out in the lobby for a little bit, we're going to see a lot of people coming in and out of that building. Am I right? Yes. Who are the most of those people? Who do you think they are? They're tenants. And what do they pay? Rent. And why are these programs called direct participation programs? Because the general partner will distribute and directly have you participate in all the passive income and all the passive losses. You will participate in all of the financial activity that goes on throughout this program investment because the result of the program investment flow down to you. Are you with me so far? Flow down to you how? In the form of passive income or passive losses. What is some of the financial activity I'm qualifying now can flow down to you? passive income from tenant rental income. Are you with me so far? Yes. As a matter of fact, we can, with financial definitive projection, determine how much money in passive income you're going to get day one. Because we know that that building that we just bought, if you'll allow me and further indulge me, has a 65% tenant occupancy rate and 35% tenant vacancy rate. So we know how much of that tenant income will be generated day one and that's the income that flows down to you in the form of passive income is this a program that provides you with income day one say yes. yes when you have a program that provides you with income day one this is a type of program that series seven bullet one known as being cash flow oriented providing you with passive income day one are you with me so far yes and if the income exceeds the losses distributed to limited partners, listen carefully. If the passive income that's being distributed to you is exceeding the passive losses that's being distributed to you, this is a profitable program. Are you with me so far? Yes. This is a program that is starting out with what is known as seven, the crossover point. The crossover point is the point in a program life. This is seven, where the passive income exceeds the passive losses as the program is becoming profitable. Are you with me so far? Yes. There's a very high probability that we could be beginning with the crossover point in a program that is cash flow oriented, providing you with passive income day one. So, from a suitability point of view as a financial advisor, when you're on the phone issuing a recommendation to the client to buy into a limited partnership and he's looking for income, you might want to recommend a cash flow oriented program rather than one that's providing with flow through tax treatment passive losses initially, passive income initially. Are you with me so far? Yes. So, what you care about most from an analysis point of view when you as a limited partner invest in an existing property limited partnership program are the passive income levels that you receive the cash flow from your tenants am I right yes. so when you analyze a an existing property limited partnership program what is the most important variable that you must analyze to determine your passive income your tenants series 7 and their stability now I'm going to give you a tenant analysis. Are you with me so far? What we care about is our tenants and their stability because their stability is vital to determine the level of passive income you receive day one from your existing tenants in the form of their rent. Are you with me? Yes. Listen carefully. I want to talk to you about half of the tenants that are in that building. Listen to what I've said to you earlier. I've just said that that building that we just bought with your $25 million in cost basis capital has a 65% tenant occupancy rate and a 35% tenant vacancy rate. Now I want to talk about half of the tenants that are in that building. Half of the tenants that are in that building have what are known as five-year short-term leases. Are you with me so far? Yes. 
the maturity of those leases is about to come to fruition just a couple of months from now, December 31st, 2009, which is just several months away. Are you with me so far? Yes. The last day of this year, those leases come due to mature. Are you with me? Yes. I want to talk to you about your mayor. His name is Bloomberg. Do you know him? I know him. He's the mayor of New York City. Every mayor of a great city wants to be having known, done something significant during their mayoral ship. Are you with me so far? Yes. They want to be known for something significant in addition to being the mayor um, when they go out uh, from their term. Let's take a look at exactly what I mean. If we look at Mayor Dinkins, do you remember him? He was after Koch. Are you with me so far? I think that uh, one of the things, and despite all of his political problems that he had during his mayoral ship, there was a lot of racial tension during the particular time of his administration. There was one thing that was very clear. There was no way that we were going to have Arthur Ashe Stadium uh, in the new uh, displacement of Flushing Meadows tennis stadium that we have today. And you just saw the U.S. Open, whether you like tennis or not, if it wasn't for Dinkins. He was on a mission to make sure he got the financing to build that stadium. So despite all of the accolades that he might be known for, when we think of Dinkins, we think of the new tennis stadium that we have that replaces the old and Flushing Meadow. Are you with me so far? Yes. This particular mayor is no exception. He wants to be known for having done something significant in this great city uh, as a mayor. And unfortunately, during his administration, Administration, September 11, 2001 occur. Am I right? Yes. So he's been on this mission, Bloomberg, to revitalize Lower Manhattan because when the terrorist attacks occurred in 2001, a lot of businesses fled Lower Manhattan. They went to Jersey City across the Hudson for cheaper rents. Are you with me so far? <laughs> lost the city, lost a lot of revenue. So he's been on this mission to revitalize and keep businesses down here in Lower Manhattan. So I want to tell you what he did in his revitalization mission. He established a line of demarcation below Canal Street and isolated certain buildings. And he said to tenants, existing and new, if you consider keeping your businesses down here in these certain buildings that we've earmarked throughout administration, then you would qualify as a tenant for what is known as the Bloomberg package of a tenant rental concession. It's an exciting package. Listen to this package. Up to $2 million we will pay to build out your space. No cost to the tenant. Right there, it's fabulous. And as a matter of fact, for a client of mine, I'm going through a build out right now uh, on State Street, which is uh, at least $1.5 million at a cost to the building because it is one of those buildings that qualifies for the Bloomberg package. Are you with me so far? Yes. Six months free rent, second part of the component of the Bloomberg package if you stay down here as a business rather than going to some other location. And uh, you will get and receive as a tenant a $3.80 per square foot tax deduction against income. And I'll throw in electric for the first nine months for free. It's a staggering incentive. Are you with me so far? Yeah. To keep businesses down here. These certain buildings are buildings that qualify tenants for what is called a Bloomberg package to allow buildings to stay down here. Unfortunately, 30 Broad that we just bought in this partnership is not one of those buildings. So what do you think the probability is that exists that when December 31st of 2009 roll around and those short-term leases are maturing, are you with me so far? Yeah. Some of those tenants might not renew and they might jump to a more induced tenant rental concession building that qualifies for the Bloomberg package. It's pretty great. Are you with me so far? Yes. And if they don't renew on our short-term tenant lease analysis side, <laughs> then what's going to do to, what is that going to do to tenant stability? It's going to Series 7 increase tenant instability, and what's that going to do to your passive income? It's going to reduce your passive income because that rent roll will no longer be there. Are you with me so far? Yes. So Series 7 bullet one on the short-term tenant lease analysis side you have to determine, as an investor, when you would invest capital in an existing property, real estate, living in the partnership program, Series 7, Bullet 1, the capacity of renewal of your tenant leases. Because if that renewal is non-existent, that's going to reduce your tenant income, increase tenant instability, and reduce your overall return. Are you with me? Yes. yes. Now, what about the other 50% of the tenants that are in that building? They have what are known as, listen to me very carefully today, 50-year long-term leases. Now, these leases are obsolete today. They're no longer issued. Are you with me so far? Yes. But 20 years ago, they were very popular. Are you with me? Yes. That means that building we just bought with your $25 million in aggregate cost basis has tenants that are in that building with long-term leases. Tenants that have been in that building for 20 years, those leases have 30 years due to mature. Are you with me so far? Yes. Now, 
For the next 30 years going forward, the income that you're going to receive from your tenant rental income from your long-term tenants, those long-term leases do not have Series 7, Bullet 1, today's inflation escalation provisions built into those long-term leases. So what does that mean to the limited partner? It means that the tenant rental income that you're receiving now and you're going to receive for the next 30 years from your long-term tenants is not adjusted for inflation, so therefore your income is going to be eroded uh, because those long-term leases do not have inflation escalation provisions built into those long-term tenant leases. So the income you're getting now and for the next 30 years will be eroded as a result of inflation. And that could affect your overall passive income. So a complete analysis of both your long-term and short-term tenant leases are required to determine the projection of passive income before you would invest your capital in an existing property limited partnership program. Are you with me? Yes. Now, I want to move to the third real estate limited partnership program. And that partnership program is called a Section 8 program. Are you with me so far? Yes. I want to talk to you before I talk about this type of program uh, about Bill Clinton. You remember him? Yeah. yeah, he was a great president. What's so great about him? Well, we considered him from Wall Street's point of view, and I think in the country, one of the finest salesmen that has ever hit the White House. You want to know why he was a great salesman? And he was, and he still is. Because when you can lie and defy a grand jury, are you with me so far, yes. and avoid impeachment, and all of the malfeasance that went on in that Oval Office that we don't have to go into right now. Are you with me so far? Yes. And then in that Oval Office, go to the West Wing, take a shower, and walk out the front door with your raincoat, with your hand on your wife and your hand on your daughter, and the good book Bible in your hand, and go to church on Easter Sunday. We believe that that's a great president. Are you with me so far? <laughs> what a salesman he is. But then after his second term, he became a private citizen, and he needed an office to do what ex-presidents do, whatever that is. Are you with me so far? Yeah. Where did he go? Harlem. Harlem. He went to Harlem to get an office. Magnificent from a marketing point of view. Do you have any idea what Harlem was like? I was there in Harlem that day when Bill Clinton went to Harlem looking for office space. They lost their minds in the streets. They were acting this way. Bill's coming to Harlem! Bill's coming to Harlem! Why were they so excited? Simply because an ex-president was going to Harlem? Because by the presence uh, of an ex-president taking office space in Harlem, he shot up Harlem's real estate by more than 26 percent in value. Are you with me so far? Yes. Ex-presidents have that kind of impact. Are you with me? Yes. What a tremendous tremendous opportunity for Harlem. Harlem has been under revitalization for the last 20 years. It's not what you quite think at the corner of Malcolm X Boulevard and Adam Clayton Powell Drive. It's very expensive, not far from Columbia Studios and more than $2,500 a month. I've trained many students who have studios over there. Are you with me so far? Yes. Ah, but the Bowery. The Bowery is still a very depressed region. Wants to be where Harlem is today. Are you with me so far? Yes. I got a hell of an idea. You know what I'm going to do as your fiduciary and general partner? I'm going to go down to the Bowery today, specifically at 3 o'clock in the afternoon. I'm going to bring with me your $25 million in cost basis limited partnership capital. And just before I go down there, I'm going to make a phone call to the federal agency called HUD, the Housing and Urban Development Corporation. And I'm going to say, HUD, listen, uh, aren't you a federal agency and don't you receive federal funding to build low income housing and depressed? regions. Yeah, that's what you do for a living. Good. Listen, I got a great idea, Hud. I'm taking $25 million from a New York City limited partnership program, and I'm going down to the Bowery to build low-income housing in low-income areas called Series 7, Section 8 Real Estate Limited Partnership Program Investments. Can you meet us down there, Hud, at 3 o'clock this afternoon with some of your federal funding? And we'll come into this partnership together. You'll bring federal funding. We'll bring $25 million of limited partnership cost basis capital, and together, this partnership, along with that federal agency with federal funding, will build low-income housing in the Bowery, known as Section 8 Real Estate Limited Partnership Programs. Because this partnership is bringing into this partnership a federal agency with federal funding, are you with me so far? Yes. The IRS is going to allow this partnership advantages that no other partnership will receive. Are you with me so far? Yes. Advantage number one, should this partnership require a loan? Should we need to borrow money? That's over and above your $25 million in cost basis. Are you with me so far? Yes. We will be allowed to borrow Series 7 Bullet 1 at a very low cost of leverage. And the money that we do borrow, Series 7 Bullet 2, will ignore inflation. We can borrow greater real dollars 
simply because we're bringing in a federal agency. We'll be allowed to borrow money at a very low cost of leverage and greater real dollars. The money we do borrow will ignore inflation simply because we're revitalizing the real estate economy. Look at what we're doing with your capital, building low-income housing with the federal government low-income areas. That's advantage number one. Advantage number two, at the end of the tax year, this partnership is going to qualify for seven investment tax credits, which are further deductions against partnership income, allowing us to become more profitable, to distribute at a greater level of passive income to limited partners, simply because we're bringing in a federal agency for the revitalization of low-income housing. Are you with me so far? Yes. No other partnership will receive investment tax credits like a Section 8 real estate limited partnership program. Are you with me so far? Yes. A couple of disadvantages that you should consider before investing as a limited partner in a Section 8 real estate limited partnership program. Are you taking your capital in a partnership that's building low-income housing in a low-income area? Say yes. yes. Seven, there's a high risk of foreclosure on property in a depressed region and a historic lack, Series 7 Bullet 2 of appreciation on property in a depressed region that could affect your passive income in this partnership. Lack of appreciation, significant, and high risk of foreclosure. Should consider those areas before you invest your capital in this limited partnership program. Are you with me so far? Yes. The final real estate limited partnership program is called Raw Land. I want you to take your $25 million, a million dollars from each and every one of you invested in a partnership that is in raw land and raw nature. Are you with me so far? Yes. Give me the address of five acres in the borough of Manhattan, the financial capital of the world, of five acres of raw land. Hard to find. You can't use Central Park. It's a designated sanctuary of non-buildable space. You can't use Ground Zero. It's already taken. You can't use the West Side Highway. It's already taken with the rail cars were there. Are you with me so far? Yes. All right, I'm sorry. It's a tall request. How about one acre? How about one-third of an acre? Give me one-eighth of an acre in the financial capital of the world of raw land just waiting for somebody to come along and build on it. It's hard to find. What if I found it? Your GP out there, you're a master and commander. What if I took your $25 million and bought land in its raw state? Are you with me so far? Yes. Why would we do something like this in this partnership program? I mean, we're not looking to build on this property. Are you with me so far? Yes. But we are looking to sell this capital asset, hopefully for more than your $25 million in cost basis, to generate Series 7 a capital gain, because that is known as a capital asset, raw land. Stocks, bonds, raw land, the commercial real property we saw last week in taxation are capital assets. And so, if this partnership takes cost basis from limited partnership money, in a raw land limited partnership program, the only advantage is to sell that capital asset for the potential capital gain that could be generated on the appreciation of land in its raw state. Agree? Yes. Well, we got a problem, though. In order to generate that capital gain, it's tied to the condition of the real estate market. Am I right? And we're not dealing with a very strong real estate market right now in the country. Am I, am I right? Yes. So that might force this partnership to hold on to that raw land in its raw state until we can potentially sell it for the potential capital gain of speculation. Am I right? Yes. Which would mean, by holding it on to it for an extensive period of time, that this partnership will receive disadvantage number one, no cash flow and no income. Because land in its raw state generates no cash flow and no income. And furthermore, for the thir third disadvantage, you can't write off land in its raw state. It generates no depreciation deductions. And what about all the staggering maintenance costs and taxes that we're going to have to spend in order to hold that land in its raw state until we can sell it for the generated depreciation of the capital gain? Significant disadvantages off the potential diversified advantage tied to the condition of the real estate market are part of the evaluation of investing money from a limited partner point of view in land in its raw state. End of the real estate side. Seven. You with me? Yes. And now it's time to go drill for sweet baby black crude in them their hills. I'm talking about the oil and gas programs where there is drilling. Whether that drilling is to a massive degree or to a marginal degree at best, in an oil and gas program, there are drilling costs associated with drilling. These drilling costs are known as IDCs, Series 7, also called intangible drilling costs. They represent, definition bullet one of IDCs, the startup costs and the startup drilling expenses associated with an oil and gas drilling program where there is drilling. Now, these expenses are Series 7 Bullet 1, labor, core analysis,
chemical analysis, topography report, all of those expenses that I've just qualified, which NASDAQ seeks, which are examples of IDCs, are the startup expenses that must be paid for initially as incurred right away by limited partners of any oil and gas program. They want to know the definition of IDCs? They are the startup expenses associated with drilling of any oil and gas program where there is drilling. Second question was examples of IDCs, chemical analysis and core analysis and the cost of labor and the cost for the least expenditures of the industrial equipment and the core analysis and the topography report of the survey of the land. These are all startup costs associated with oil and gas drilling where there's drilling. These costs, I further said, are expensed as incurred by home limited partners. Are you with me? You're going to have to pay for those expenditures as incurred in this partnership. Are you with me so far? Yes. But what's significant about these expenses, they are deductible expenses. I use the word. Are you with me so far? Yes. And that means what? In addition to the passive losses that programs generate, are you with me so far? Yes. That are used as a deduction and as a write-off against passive income to achieve flow through tax treatment, so will also any program deductible expenses as well, like IDCs. So IDCs to the limited partner are favorable. Although you will pay for them and they are expensed as incurred by the limited partner in the program's life, are you with me so far? Yes. They do have some kind of salvageable value. Not that you're getting those costs returned back to you, but that you can use those costs and expenditures as a deduction and as a write-off, that along with passive losses against passive income, which will ultimately be favorable because that will reduce your tax liability on passive income to achieve a higher level of profit distributed to you in the form of passive income. Are you with me so far? Yes. The program with the highest IDC level, Series 7 Bullet 1, your first oil and gas program is the Wildcat program the exploratory program. This is a program that uses program capital from the limited partner, are you with me so far, yes. to drill in an area of unproven crude. Seven, to go explore, to drill on the wild, are you with me so far? Yes. The probabilities of hitting a dry hole and becoming non-profitable in an exploratory program are great, am I right? Yes. Why, if we go drill off Bora Bora in Fiji, are you with me so far? We don't know what's down there and then there hills. This program carries the highest risk of becoming non-profitable. This program has a massive amount of drilling. Therefore, it has the highest IDC level. But if this program is successful in that, if it taps into oil, in an unproven region, it will be a gusher. So when they ask you for the program on the oil and gas side that carries the highest risk, that is potentially offset with the highest return of the success, that program, seven, is wildcatting. Agreed? Yes. Agreed. Highest IDC level. Most amount of drilling occurred in a wildcat program. However, the second type of oil and gas program is a little bit more conservative in nature in that I'm going to take your capital right now. Please look at me, and I'm going offshore Kuwait. I'm going to the Middle East. We know what's down there. We die for what's down there. That's why our presence is so significant. There's oil in them, there hills. Am I right? Yes. If I take your $25 million in program capital and go offshore Kuwait to drill in this area where we know there's crude, we are drilling in an area of proven crude. Am I right? Yes. This type of oil and gas program, Series 7 Bullet 2, is called a developmental program. Drilling in an area of proven resource. Is there drilling? Yes. Does this program have IDCs? Yes. Does this program have a proven return? Yes. And that we're drilling in an area of proven crude. It's called a developmental program. The program that is the best of all worlds from an investor point of view, third in nature, Series 7 is called the Balanced Oil and Gas Program. The Balanced Oil and Gas Program is the consolidation, Series 7 Bullet 1, of the Wildcat and Developmental Program all rolled into one type of program. I'm talking about the Balanced Oil and Gas Program now. Number three, are you with me? Yes. What are the advantages of a balanced program? What are the disadvantages? Well, let's take a look at it one more time. The balanced oil and gas program I just said to you is the consolidation of the exploratory and the developmental program all rolled into one type of program. That means some of the $25 million will be used in this balanced program, the Wildcat, and some of the $25 million will be used to drill in an area of proven crude. So therefore, the balanced program brings the advantages and the disadvantages of the exploratory and the developmental program all rolled into one program. 
The high risk aspect of balanced drilling is wildcatting, and the high return aspect of balanced drilling is developmental. The program with high risk and high return, seven, balanced. Are you with me so far? Yes. Seven. Now, I want to talk to you about the seven sisters of America. Do you know who they are? Don't be shy to respond with me. If you don't know, just tell me. Do you know who they are? No. no. They're the seven oil companies of America. Are you with me? Yes. Hess, Exxon, we know who they are. They are in the business of doing one thing. It's like a shark. You know what a shark does? It kills, it eats, kills, and makes babies. It kills, eats, and makes little sharks all day long. That's all it does. It's a magnificent machine, and so are the oil companies. They're in the, building, in the business of constantly drilling for oil in untapped regions. Are you with me so far? Yes. Securing that crude like a shark and utilizing that crude to refine it as either petroleum or bunker fuel uh, for the world. That's what they do for a living, just like a shark. Are you with me so far? Yes. Well, I got to talk to you where the good people live out in a place called Iowa. Anybody here from the Midwest or Middle America, Nebraska, Iowa, Kansas, Duluth, Minnesota? Well, let me tell you something about the heartland of America. That's considered the heartland of America. There are good people that live there. And what do I mean by good people? Does that mean that here on the East Coast we're not good people? I think we're good people. You know, we have a hard exterior, but we have a soft heart in the tri-state area. There's no question about it. But let me give you an example of what happens to you when you cross across the street and a car is coming. Do you think that car is going to stop for you? No, you're going to get hit. Am I right? Yes. Let me ask you another question. If somebody comes up to you on the street of Manhattan and says, you know what, I know your father. First of all, don't touch me. My father's dead for seven years and you don't know me either. Uh, do you think that's going to be a good conversation? If somebody comes up to you, they probably want money from you. I want you to ride the subway. Have you ridden the subway recently? Have you? Yes. I want you to ride the subway. There's a certain etiquette. Uh, on the subway that you have to know about that you won't know about if you're a tourist. And the etiquette says this, don't ride on the subway and do something like this. Look at somebody dead in the eye. Because that's going to stimulate the response, what are you looking at? <laughs> that can't be good. So then if you don't look at somebody in the eye, you kind of look off them a little bit. Like I'm riding the subway right now. I'm not really looking at you. I'm not really looking away from you, but I'm not I'm looking through you, but I'm not looking right at you. We, that direct contact is like a challenge around here. Everything is a threat. You know it and I know it. It's part of the fabric of living in New York City. But when you get off the plane and you end up in Duluth, Minnesota, and you walk the streets and you're looking for a cab, I want to tell you what happens if you've ever been out there. People come up to you on the street and they say things to you like this. Did you just get in the town? And now we start going into that Robert De Niro taxi driver routine. You talking to me? You can't be talking to me. You know, there's a wonderful Bible reading class at the local Presbyterian church in town on Tuesday. We'd love to have you. You love to want me. We'd love to have you. These people really want to embrace you. They are the good people of America. That's where they really, really, where they really live. There's no question about it. It's a unique experience. Well, out in Iowa, where the good people live, you know, uh, I want to tell you what Exxon was doing. Exxon was drilling, and I want to tell you what they did. They hit oil. They found an oil well. Are you with me so far? Yes. No more drilling. They have drilled past tense. I am your fiduciary and general partner. You know what I'm going to do? I'm going to call them up and say, Exxon, I understand that out there in the heartland of America and Iowa, you've secured an oil well. Is that so? <coughs> Exxon says that's so. It means it's true. Exxon, watch my transaction. I, a general partner on behalf of this New York City Limited Partnership Program, uh, am prepared to offer you a bid of $25 million, which represents limited partnership cost basis capital for the lease to that property. And Exxon does that transaction. What is your cost basis purchased? It purchased the lease for the rights for the acquisition to the acquisition of property that contains oil. Are you with me so far? Yes. We're technically buying an oil well. Now, what is the general partner going to do with that oil well? I'm going to sell that oil out there in the secondary market and immediately, day one, distribute passive income to you uh, in the form of the profits from the sale of that crude. The last type of oil and gas program is called the income program because it generates income in the form of Series 7 Bullet 1 cash flow day one as a result of the cost basis that's being utilized for the acquisition of a lease for the rights to property that contains oil. This program, Series 7 Bullet 2, has no IDCs. There's no drilling. Exxon has already done the drilling. 
and we're purchasing a lease for the rights to oil. Are you with me so far? Yes, yes. And so therefore it is cash flow oriented. We have a question from Donegan. Yes, Donegan. Um, after the general partner has acquired the land and you've distributed the funds, um, what what's the continuance of funds? You know, it's really not the land that we're acquiring, and I don't want you to be confused about that. It's the not the land, but it's the lease to the rights to the well. That doesn't mean land ownership. And so after that uh, oil reserve has been depleted, are you with me so far, which is technically all we're buying, not the land and the assets of the real estate. Uh, that's the extent of the advantages and the assets of that particular type of partnership program. All we're looking to do is have the rights to that oil, to sell that oil out there in the secondary market. So we don't have many deductions in this particular partnership because it is cash flow oriented. We're well, it's not that it's over. Right. It's only over and terminated when the death of retirement sanity, even though GB can, uh, uh, expires, yeah. has occurred, which would end the termination of the partnership's life. Okay. The partnership is still alive, but the partnership is no longer drawing any profits once the crude is sold because the assets are sold out there in the market. All we're buying is the assets, which are the oil. So what's the partnership doing after that? It could be engaging other transactions and other investments and other programs, but this particular program's only sold exclusive and advantage is through the sale of the natural resource that will be distributed over a period of time to limit the partners in the form of passive income. Uh, so we, we see the different types of programs, and that's really the analysis, and look at every one of those features and variables from the investor point of view. Are you with me so far? Yes. And now we move to the exciting tax ramifications of this particular tax shelter, and I think you see we're dealing with significant and sizable uh, investments. Are you with me so far? Yes. This is not a $10,000 investment from an accredited client. One million, five million, seven million dollars invested, and it all comes down to um, a couple of areas on taxation, and so now I'd like you to brace yourself. Are you with me so far? Yes. Let's go over the menu first before we go into these regulations and wind down this particular strategy and tax shelter. First area here today is on the tax ramifications of the partnership itself, which is uh, Waco, Texas, to use that example if we can continue with that. After we move from the tax treatment of the partnership, we'll move into the tax treatment of real property which is that last capital asset that we saved for today in addition to raw land. Are you with me so far? Yes. That complements stocks and bonds from taxation on Friday as the capital assets that are consistent with NASDAQ. And then after we'll then go into why we came here today, which is to achieve flow through tax treatment, which you have a little bit of an idea for, and the staggering deductions that are afforded by the program, the ability to take passive losses as a write-off and as a deduction against passive income, along with any program deductible expenses. Are you with me so far? Yes. And then find out how much the limited partner is worth by the end of the tax year in Waco, Texas, known as the adjusted cost basis of that limited partner. This is the menu. Let's go into the regulations right now. I want you to know that responsibility lies on the general partner to maintain the books and records of the partnership. Are you with me so far? Yes. To distribute out any and all passive income and any and all passive losses to those limited partners because the results of this investment flow down to the investor in the form of passive of income or passive losses. Are you going to so far? Yes. Is the General partner would like to take certain write-offs against the income of the partnership. Are you with me so far? Yes. In the management and the maintenance of the books and records of the partnership. Some of those deductions that the partnership may take are seven bullet one depletion usage deductions on natural resources. Now let me explain to you what that means, but I need you to listen to me carefully. When we have a certain level of natural resource, when we hit oil, are you with me so far? And by the way, we could not just be drilling for oil, we could be drilling for iron ore, coal, natural gas. They are all known as natural resources. Are you with me so far? Yes. What is the general partner going to do with those natural resources? What is he going to do with that oil? He's going to sell that oil out there in the secondary market. Look at what happened when the general partner sold the natural resource. Look at me. It got used up. That usage of that natural resource getting used up as a result of its sale is transferred onto the balance sheet of the partnership uh, allowable by the IRS in the form of a depletion usage deduction allowance. We get as a partnership a write-off just for using it up as a result of selling it against partnership income. Are you with me so far? Yes. And then as a result of its sale, 
we get income in the form of passive income. There's a double benefit there. When we hit oil, when we sell it, we use it up. We get a depletion usage deduction allowance against income. Are you with me so far? And we get passive income as a result of its sale in the secondary market distributed to you. So, Natural Resources Series 7 Bullet 1 generate depletion usage deduction allowances. The fixed assets that we're using, which are the industrial equipment for the drilling of that natural resource, depreciate. Fixed assets always generate depreciation deductions. Natural resources generate depletion usage deduction allowances. These deductions are write-offs that are taken against the income of the partnership on the books and records by the general partner to make that partnership more profitable that will ultimately distribute greater levels of passive income to limited partners by the end of the tax year. Sit. Are you with me? Yes. Yes. Stay right there. Are you with me? Yes. Stay with me. I'll have your license in 50 days. Believe me when I tell you, I'm that good. I got the seven right here. I just need you with me. That's all I need you to do. Are you with me? Yes. I want to do a transaction with you, but this transaction is not in the form of any real estate limited partnership program. This is an isolated transaction. Take a look at this transaction, not the body of your work. Look at this transaction. I want you here. I want you with me, not there. An investor goes out there in the marketplace and buys a commercial building known as real property. The original cost for that building was $100,000. Are you with me so far? Yes. A year later went by after the purchase of that building. How long? A year. One year from the date that he bought it. And he looked at the building and he saw structural problems in the foundation. Are you with me so far? Yes. He said that this building generated $45,000 of depreciation known as wear and tear. Are you with me so far? Yes. After the $45,000 of depreciation deductions were taken against the original cost of the building, are you with me so far? Yes. That building's adjusted value is worth $55,000. Are you with me so far? Yes. He then went out to the investor and sold that commercial building out there into the secondary market and sold it for a $75,000 building sale. What was generated here in the language of taxation is a $20,000 capital gain because it is the sale of a capital asset capturing a sale price that's higher than the adjusted cost basis that was adjusted down to $45,000 after the to $55,000 after the $45,000 of depreciation deductions were taken. Are you with me so far? Yes. Okay. The $20,000 capital gain. How should it be taxed and what rate? That's two questions. How should it be taxed? Answer at the capital gains tax rate. Are you with me? Yes. Now the second question and the answer to that is even more profound. At what rate? I want the rate. First of all, that is not a capital gains tax rate. It's either going to be taxed at, let me help you here. This is what we must know coming into this week. That's why we reviewed last week to get ready for today. 20% is not a capital gains tax rate. We only have two capital gains tax rates, right, for short-term and long-term holding periods. The long-term capital gains tax rate is the flat tip 15%. The short-term capital gains tax rate is 35% OI high. So let's bring to the table what we should know that is correct first. Now I'll ask you again for the rate of the $20,000 capital gain. Before you answer the rate, you have to identify the holding period that generated the gain. What is the holding period? What is the holding period? One Don't year. say a year. Tell me long term or short term. short term. No, sir. One year later from the date that the building was purchased means that this $20,000 is a long term capital gain. Mike, you're all over the place. Yeah. I'm trying to save you and you're crushing yourself as each blow goes by. That's a long term capital gain. Is that agreed? Yes. Can I have the rate that should be levied by the IRS? That's the answer to the question. That's the rate it should be. Are you with me? Yes. But that's not what's going to happen. Are you with me? Yes. And we're back into that holy war between Wall Street and the IRS, and here it comes. Are you with me? Yes. Here is what the IRS is going to do. They're going to tax one half of the rate, one half of the gain, at the long-term capital gains tax rate, which is what percentage? Can I have it? Thank you. And look at how they tax the other 50% of the same gain at the short-term capital gains tax rate, which is? 35%. Thank you, sir. Now the question becomes, why did the S break up the tax treatment of this one singular capital gain and tax 50% of it at the short-term rate and the other 50% of the long-term capital gains tax rate? Because the IRS, by breaking up the tax treatment of this capital gain, are you with me so far? Yes. Recaptured back in tax revenue 20% on only 50% of the gain that they would have lost if they would in fact tax the $20,000 capital gain at the long-term capital gains tax rate. 
This concept is known as Series 7 Recapture. The IRS, please look at what's happening again, is recapturing back in tax revenue 20% on 50% of the gain that they would have lost if they would have taxed this $20,000 capital gain as it should have been at the 15% tax rate. Are you with me so far? Yes. Because it is technically a long-term capital gain. Uh, then they would have lost what they're trying to recapture back. By breaking up the tax treatment of this one capital gain and taxing 50% of it at the short-term rate and the other 50% of the long-term rate, they're recapturing back in tax revenue 20% on 50% of the gain that they clearly would have lost if they would have taxed the full long-term capital gain at the long term capital gains tax rate. Concept, regulation is only once on the seven. You'll see it. Now let me give you the question and I'll give you the answer just the way you'll see it on NASDAQ. Are you with me? Yes. The tax treatment of a singular capital gain is a result of the sale of commercial real property, whereby 50% of the gain is taxed at the short term rate and the residual of same gain. That's the way it's worded on NASDAQ, which means the other 50% of the same capital gain is taxed at the long-term capital gains tax rate is the concept known as set and recapture. With me? Yes. Stay right there. One foot over the other. One at a time. We'll get it. Are you with me? Yes. Because I got it. Well, let's talk about why we came here. We came here for one primary investment objective. Sure, those programs that are cash flow oriented are dynamic, especially when I think cash flow is the number one concept right now in the market and in the country that is more of an overriding financial factor than net worth. Are you with me so far? Yeah. You can kiss net worth goodbye. We care about cash flow in order to survive. Liquidity for businesses, liquidity for investors. Are you with me so far? Yes. Cash flow is tantamount to everything. Are you with me so far? Yes. But um, we came here today for the program staggering write-offs. Are you with me? Yes. The ability to tag passive losses and or program deductible expenses without any double limitation and use them as a write-off and as a deduction against passive income. Passive income is normally taxed just like earned income is taxed at OI. If we can write off passive income with the program's deductions, we can reduce our tax liability on passive income and we can achieve a higher level of passive income distribution. Are you with me so far? Yes. That's the whole point here. And so, flow through tax treatment breaks down to three cases. Case one is the classic case that we have been saying for the last two hours. 100% of any and all passive losses, along with any and all program deductible expenses, are used as a write-off against passive income. Are you with me so far? Yes. To achieve flow-through tax treatment, case one, to take those passive losses and program deductible expenses as a write-off against passive income, we're netting out the losses against the income. Are you with me so far? Yes. To net out the losses against the income financially and mathematically is to subtract passive losses against passive income. And once you take the passive losses and use them as a write-off and as a deduction against the passive income by netting them out from one another, which is subtracting from one another, the mathematical result would be the excess. Now, if the excess is passive losses, are you with me so far? Yes. Those passive losses, we said, are carried forward to the following tax year to be used to future write-off against future passive income. However, if the excess were passive income at the end of that tax year, after flow-through tax treatment were netted out against one another and achieved, well, that excess passive income is then taxed at the end of that same tax year to the limited partner in his bracket at OI. Because passive income, whether it's excess or existing, is taxed at OI. Are you with me? Yes. So the basic rule is what we've been saying all along. I'm going to say it in English one more time and switch into DPP language for NASDAQ. Passive losses are used as a write-off against passive income. If after you take the passive losses, you use them as a write-off against the passive income, if the excess is passive losses, the excess passive loss is carried forward to the following tax year to be used as a future write-off against future passive income. If the excess, after flow-through tax treatment was achieved, is passive income, then that excess, excess, excess passive income is taxed at the end of that same tax year to the limited partner at OI. Is that agreed? Yes. Really? Okay, well let's take a look at NASDAQ. I'm going to speak to you like the seven now. Are you with me so far? Yes. Are you ready? Yes. Excuse me. Got to get my Stradivarius out. Are you ready? Yes. At the beginning of the tax year of 2009, Mr. Johnson is a limited partner who has invested in dual limited partnership programs. Watch my language. Program A, new construction. Program B, existing properties. By the end of that same tax year, the new construction limited partnership program distributed and paid out $250,000 of existing passive losses. The word existing means throughout the year. Are you with me? Yes. Watch the language. 
The existing properties limited partnership program on the real estate side, program B, distributed out $100,000 of existing passive income in the form of tenant rental income. NASDAQ will then say with that done transaction to achieve flow through tax treatment. To achieve flow through tax treatment is to take the 100% of passive losses, which is the $250,000 from new construction, and use it as a write off against the $100,000 of passive income. Are you with me so far? Yeah, yes. And the result mathematically is $150,000. Watch this word, this is mathematical. Of excess. The word excess is only mathematically achieved when the existing passive losses are used as a write-off against the existing passive income in the program throughout the year. Are you with me so far? $150,000, $150,000 of excess passive losses. And the answer is to be carried forward to the following tax year, to 2010, to be used as a future write-off from 2010 against future passive income. Agreed? Yes. I want you to take a look at the $100,000 of passive income from tenant rental income from the existing property program. No tax on 100 G's. Are you with me so far? Yes. Show me another investment this explosive where you can receive and earn $100,000 in income without a tax liability incurred. And furthermore, not only is there no taxes on $100,000 of passive income, you got future write offs next year as well. Are you with me so far? Yes. Can you see the explosion of the tax shelter? We're dealing with accredited money here. Are you with me so far? Yes. So if you really believe that the only security you're going to be buying and selling and trading is equities, it's far from the truth. Accredited money is going into these investments because they're looking to receive income and shelter that income with losses. Are you with me so far? Yes. And you will be participating as a financial advisor with staggering amounts of limited partnership investments, especially when you're dealing with accredited clients. Are you with me so far? Yes. Case one, the classic case. All those passive losses are used as a write-off against 100% of any and all passive income. If the excess is passive losses after flow through tax treatment was achieved, carry the excess passive losses forward uh, to the following tax year to be used as a future write-off against future passive income. Are you with me so far? Yes. It's the case as we've always known it to be for the last two hours. Are you with me? Yes. Case two, built into flow through tax treatment regulation is quite different. Are you with me so far? Yes. Your name, sir? Joe. Joe, a limited partner in Waco says, listen, uh, I want to talk to you about uh, Tuscany, Italy. This, by the way, is a true story, and I'm fascinated by it. And the reason why some of the people that know me from the past know I've spoken about it before, like Lucas, uh, a while back, who's trained with me, is because I wish I was called to invest in this project. Tuscany, Italy is the greens of Italy, and the rolling hills of the fine wines there are some of the greatest and most expensive wines in the world are grown right out of the hills of Tuscany, Italy. Are you with me so far? Yes. We all know that. Whether or not we're buying these wines or not, and Opus One and the likes, we know $150, $75 a bottle. Some of the finest wines in the world are from Tuscany, Italy, not just France. If you've ever seen Tuscany, Italy, there are no telephone wires in Tuscany, Italy. There's no commercialism there. It's strictly for wine growing. Are you with me so far? Yes. The very first time the Italian government has approved in excess of a $4 billion five-star resort to be built right in the middle of Tuscany, Italy wine country. Unbelievable. Are you with me so far? Yes. And certain selective investors have been tapped in to invest in that project. Are you with me so far? Yes. One of those selective investors is Joe. Joe, one of our limited partners in Waco, who has a $1 million investment in Waco, has been asked to invest in that project. A limited partner contacts a general partner and asks to sell his partnership interest in Waco to another limited partner. Your name, sir? Gio. To Gio. To get out of this investment, which is contingent upon my approval, because it's not free for you to do so. Are you with me so far? Yes. Maybe you wanted to sell half of your partnership interest in Waco. Your full interest is $1 million. I use that number as an example. But in this particular case, it's a full limited partnership sale. Are you with me so far? Yes. It's contingent upon GP approval. I grant that limited partner the approval to sell out of Waco his full partnership interest to another limited partner for liquidity needs. Are you with me so far? Yes. The sale price was a million nine thousand dollars to Geo, because there's your nine thousand dollar gain from a partnership sale. Are you with me so far? Yes. This nine thousand dollars is not a capital gain. It is known as series seven bullet one passive income from a partnership sale to another limited partner with GP approval. Are you with me? Yes. Good. Look up, Joe. Look up, everyone. <coughs> Throughout the year of two thousand and nine, look at me, Waco. The partnership that you just sold distributed to you $11,000 of existing passive losses throughout the year. So while you were invested in Waco, Texas throughout the year of 2009, by the end of the year of 2009, that partnership distributed $11,000 in passive losses to you. And after that tax year, you then sold 
By the end of that year, your full partnership interest to an unlimited partner for a $9,000 gain. NASDAQ says achieve flow through tax treatment, and let's achieve it right now. Take the passive losses, which were $11,000 that were existingly pass flown through to you throughout the year of 2009, and use them as a write-off against the $9,000 of passive income from the partnership sale. Are you with me so far? From the partnership sale. And your answer is mathematically $2,000 of excess passive losses. Am I right? Yes. Now, what does Rule 1 say you can do with the excess passive losses? And that's what Rule 2 is going to repeat. You can take the excess passive losses on this specific transaction and carry them forward to the following tax year of 2010 that be used as the future write-off against future passive income. Or Rule 2 has a twist. You can maintain these excess passive losses right in the tax year of 2009 where they are and use them as a write-off series 7 against non-passive income. And what is another way of saying non-passive income known as? earned. For the very first time, you're seeing the ability to take the passive losses from a program and use them as a write-off against earned income. When you know that passive losses, according to the IRS code, may only be used as a write-off against passive income, not earned income, are you with me so far? Yes. You now can take passive losses, no more than $3,000 of them. Are you with me so far? I know what you're going to say, because I know what the question would be. Uh, the question would be, and I preempted his answer, because of the question I would have if I was sitting there. Oh, so now for the very first time, we can take the passive losses from a, a non-profitable program after flow through tax treatment has been achieved, and you just write off against earned income? Well, active losses has a limit of no more than $3,000. Do we have a limit on the, uh, non -passive, uh, on, the, on the passive losses? The answer is yes, no more than 3,000. Are you with me so far yes. as well? Uh, but uh, the point is a double explosion here. You can carry forward these passive losses to the following tax year of 2010 and use them as a future write-off against future passive income, or you can maintain these excess passive losses right at the end of that same tax year of 2009 and use them as a write-off against non-passive income, which is another way of saying earned income, only on this specific transaction. Now, I'm going to read to you the wording on NASDAQ on the question. Are you with me so far? Yes. And the answer, but you've got to look up in order to understand this. Take a look at concept two built into flow through tax treatment. And listen carefully and watch. The excess passive losses that were generated when flow through tax treatment was achieved, when a limited partner took his existing passive losses from his limited partnership investment throughout the year as a write-off against the income from the gain of a sale of a partial or full partnership interest only, maybe maintained in its existing tax year to be used as a write-off against non-passive income, or carried forward to the following tax year to be used as a future write-off against future passive income. Seven. Are you with me? Yes. You're going to hear me in your sleep. I'm telling you. I'm coming to NASDAQ with you. Case three is different than case two and one to complete the final regulations all built into flow through tax treatment. And that is that we have an investor who has invested in the market through you as a financial advisor. And throughout the year of 2009, and by the end of that tax year, this client has established a portfolio that has generated $500,000 in portfolio income. The $500,000 in portfolio income we said on Friday when we looked at portfolio unearned income is passive income because we said the investor was doing nothing to actively earn the cash dividends on stock and the interest income on bonds, but that was coming from the nature of the securities themselves. Are you with me so far? Yes. Look at the $500,000 more acutely. It's unearned. It's passive. It's investment income. This $500,000 consists of any potential capital gains, cash dividends on stock, and interest income on bonds for the investments with you as a financial advisor in the market. Are you with me so far? Yes. Simultaneously, this limited partner, by the end of that same tax year of 2009, has invested as a limited partner in a Section 8 real estate limited partnership program. That Section 8 program has distributed and paid out $250,000 of existing passive losses. NASDAQ says achieve flow through tax treatment. Go! We have $500,000 in portfolio passive income. We have $250,000 in existing passive losses from a Section 8 real estate limited partnership program. What we've been doing for the last 20 minutes associated with flow through tax treatment, in case you're confused, is taking the passive losses on a dollar for dollar basis without limitation and using them as a deduction and as a write off against any passive income. Are you with me so far? Yes. If the result is excess passive losses, they've been carried forward. If the result is excess passive income, it's been taxed at the end of that same tax year to the limited partner at OI. Can I have the mathematical answer to that trade right now? First of all, you have to tell me a number, then you have to tell me it's excess, and then you have to tell me whether it's on the income or on the loss side, and then how it's treated for tax purposes. I did two trades for you first. 
and I have the third. What's your answer to that transaction? To, let's start out with a number. 250,000. Okay, we got 250,000. I'm just going to get on my knees for you, okay? I would look right here if I were you. We have $250,000 of what? Excess. You got to tell me it's excess. It's excess, right? Uh, yes. These are existing passive losses. This is existing passive income, am I right, throughout the year? Yes. The result, if the flow through tax treatment is achieved, is excess, am I right? Yes. Let's get mathematical with this. So the two trades, the same way for you. So it's $250,000 of excess what? Passive income. Now tell me how it's taxed. It's taxed to the limited partner at the end of that same tax year in his bracket. Am I right? Yes. Is that your answer? You can't abstain in my room. You got to give me an answer, otherwise I'm going to physically uh, get excited. Brooklyn's going to come out. I don't want it to come out. I want to be a gentleman today. With me so far, I want to be a nice guy. But the animal will come out, and I will physically throw you out of here. Give me an answer. Is that your answer? That's certainly Mike's answer. It's not your answer. Do you have another answer, sir? Yeah. Yes. Well, let's start out well. Yeah, well. Well. Everybody's Ronald Reagan today. Well. Go ahead. Um, go with 500,000 excess. Passive How could 500,000 be excess if the existing uh, income is 500,000 and the existing loss is 250? Well, can you not use the passive loss to write off, yeah, to write off the passive income? Oh, wait a minute now. We have another thing going on over here. Forget about your mathematics because it's completely inaccurate, but the concept you're talking about is interesting to me. You're not looking to achieve flow through tax treatment here, are you? You mean to tell me that you're not, you're not, listen to me very carefully, you're not going to take these existing passive losses as a write-off against that passive income? You're not? Is that correct? Yes. Why are you not achieving flow through tax treatment here? Uh, because, because... Because the portfolio income isn't part of everyday business. Excuse me. Because the portfolio income is not part of everyday business, which means what in English? It sounds like uh, that's not income that you're earning every single day from your job, but it sounds like it's isolated income, which means what? Another ambiguous word, isolated. It sounds like it's only income that you're going to generate when you invest in the market. Well, that's whenever you do. Are you with me so far on an isolated basis? So whether it's isolated or not, you're hedging the question and the answer. Because it's isolated, uh, you're not telling me why you're not writing off the passive losses against the portfolio income. I mean, isn't portfolio income passive? Say yes. Yes. Really, and that's passive losses from the Section A program. And aren't we taking the passive losses as a runoff against the passive income? And, now for the, and the answer is yes. And now for the very first time, you're not taking passive losses from a limited partnership program as a runoff against passive income. And your reason for that is simply because the portfolio income is isolated? Is that why? You see, the ability to understand that it's isolated is not good enough. You know, you're almost right, but your rationale is wrong. It's generated from capital gains. Capital gains. Jesus, Donegan. I don't know what that means either. What's generated from capital gains? It was a movie by Stephen King who was a clown who killed six people. You've got to qualify it. What's it? <laughs> Let me explain something to you about this portfolio income. Can you go to the section in the body of your work that I promised you that we would call portfolio income? What do you know about this? Before I don't want you to read it. I just want you to go to that page. I want you to look up. Look at me for a minute. What do we know about this portfolio income? Sure, it's isolated. I'll grant you that. It's whenever we invest in the market. It's not conducted and generated in the ordinary course of business. Are you with me so far? Yes. That means whenever we invest. But how does the IRS, more importantly, treat for tax purposes portfolio income? They don't treat it as passive income, which is the problem here, because if it was treated as passive income, you can take the passive losses as a write-off against passive income. Are you so far? Yes. How do they treat portfolio income? They treat it as non-passive income, which is another way of saying what? Earned. And what do we know about passive losses from a partnership program? They may not be used as a write-off against earned income, only passive income, and therefore, as a result of that regulation on how they treat portfolio income as non-passive income, which is earned, therefore here, flow through tax treatment may, may not be achieved for that reason. Not because it's isolated income, but because of how the IRS treats portfolio income, which is uh, non-passive, which is earned, and you may not take the passive losses from a limited partnership program used as a write-off against earned income. Therefore, whenever you have passive losses that are generated in a limited partnership program life, it may not be used as a write-off against portfolio income. Sit! Flow through tax treatment may not be achieved. Now, 
I want to read it to you because I know you aren't sure about it. And under the section that says portfolio income, are we there? Yes. yes. Are we there? Yes. Let me read this to you. Stay focused. Portfolio income. I'm referring to the half a million dollars that I used in the example, which is what? Dividends and interest and capital gains from your investment in the market is not generated in the ordinary course of business. We said that three times. It's isolated whenever you invest. And therefore, it may not, series seven, that's the key area right there, second sentence, first paragraph, right there. It may not be offset with passive losses, which means what? Flow through tax treatment may not be achieved. Why? Because of the last two words in that paragraph, and the next paragraph, it is treated, that portfolio income, as non-passive income, which is another way of saying earned, and therefore, you can't take the passive losses from a limited partnership program using a write-off against earned income, only against non-passive income. Seven, flow through tax treatment may not be achieved. Close, almost there. Getting excited though. Well, I want to talk to you about the end of the tax year. Look at me for a minute. You've invested in Waco. And throughout the year, throughout the program life, throughout the year, there could have been many financial investment transactions that could have occurred that could have affected your $1 million investment, where by the end of the tax year, it is the responsibility of the general partner to find out how much you're worth. Who knows? Maybe you're worth more than a million in this investment. Maybe you're worth less than a million. Only so far? Yes. So what happens if you gave me the $1 million in your cost basis, you know that you have a limited liability for, and then throughout the year, maybe I tapped into you for a loan? Well, if you made a loan, what we've said is that the loan has adjusted your basis upward. You're worth more than a million. What happens if you received any capital gains or income from this profitable program throughout the year? That's over and above your $1 million investment. You're going to be worth more than a million. Are you with me so far? Yes. So, Series 7, any capital gains and income that you receive or loans that you make mean that your basis will go up. Your basis will be adjusted upward. You'll be worth more than a million. Are you with me? Yes. Seven. I want you to know the financial transactions that have you worth more. The following is a prerequisite for NASDAQ that if they did occur transactionally throughout the program life, would have you worth less than a million dollars. Are you with me so far? Yes. Series 7, bullet 1, losses. Series 7, bullet 2, cash distributions. Money taken out of your investment to you would mean you're worth less than a million. Partial sales of your limited partnership interests would obviously reduce your cost basis. Are you with me so far? So the following transactions, I'll repeat again, if they did occur throughout Waco, will have you worth less than a $1 million investment. Any losses, cash distributions, or, or partial sales of your limited partnership interests you would be worth less than $1 million. Are you with me so far? Yes. Now, they assume that you know. Listen to me very carefully. This is the final point, and it's very ambiguous. The transactions that if they did occur will adjust your basis upward, like loans that you make or income and gains that you receive. You know if that happens, you're worth more than a million. By the dollar amount of money of those income, of those gain levels, and of those, uh, of those um, investments. Are you with me so far? And loans that you might make. The following transactions, they assume losses, distributions, or partial sales of your limited partnership interest will reduce your basis downward. You will be worth less than a million. Are you with me so far? Yes. The seven is going to take those transactions, this is series seven now, and put them in the form of a trade similar to that. And ask you by the end of the tax year to find the limited partner's adjusted basis, how much he's worth, how much she's worth. Are you with me so far? Yes. Now, I spared you today because I only gave you two transactions, cash distributions and losses. I could have said after these cash distributions and after those losses, just prior to the end of that same tax year, then the limited partner made a $10,000 loan to the partnership and then received $3,000 in income. Are you with me so far? Yeah. I could have hit you with four or five transactions. The two transactions I've hit you with will suffice the regulation for NASDAQ. Are you with me so far? Yes. All right, now, this area is learning how to find a limited partner's adjusted cost basis in his program by the end of the year for transactions that could have occurred throughout the program life. Are you with me so far? Yes. Not only will we understand the regulation, but we'll understand the distortion that's waiting for you in NASDAQ selection of the answers as well. So brace yourself. Are you ready? Yes. Say yes. Are you? Yes. Okay, I'm going to speak to you like the seven. Watch the transaction. This is the final point. At the beginning of the year, a 2009 tax year, a limited partner had invested $30,000 in a program. 
Notice I didn't say the word basis or original or anything like that. If that's at the beginning of the program investment, are you with me so far? The $30,000, that's alternative language for referring to it as the original basis. That is assumed for NASDAQ. Are you with me? That was equivalent to why $1 million in Waco. Prior to the end of that program's tax year life, that program paid out $6,000 in cash distributions and $9,000 in losses. Find that limited partner's adjusted basis by the end of that tax year. Now, you're in NASDAQ. Look at what you know that distributions and losses do to the basis. You know they reduce basis downward. Are you with me so far? Yes. That's another prerequisite to the exam. Are you with me? Yes. And now the answers. I'll put it into a Roman numeral form. Roman numeral 1, negative 15, 2, positive 45,000. Under the assumption that you think that distributions and losses increase the basis, they're going to go the other way. Maybe you're not sure of the regulation. Are you with me so far? Yes. Roman numeral three with quotes around it, it's called the at-risk amount, which has financial meaning, which we'll get into in a moment, which is not ambiguous when you know the regulation. And Roman numeral four, none. A1, B4, C3, D2, the seven just ripped you and you didn't even see it coming because I just did it to you now and you didn't react. I can just tell from your eyes. I'm teaching you 20 years. Now, before we move forward, what is the correct answer to this transaction's client's adjusted cost basis after those losses and distributions were taken into consideration by the end of that tax year in this program? What is the correct answer? Forget about those choices for a minute. I don't want A, B, C, or D. I want the mathematical correct answer to that transaction. You started out with 30. Cash distributions were 6,000. Gave you a preliminary adjusted basis of 24,000. Then he incurred $9,000 of losses. Mathematically, what is his adjusted basis by the end of the tax year? How much is he worth in this program? 30000 No, sir. 30 minus 6 minus 9 is equal to? 15. Thank you, sir. This client started out with a $30,000 original investment in this program. He's now worth, by the end of that tax year, $15,000. The $15,000 is known as his adjusted basis. That is the correct answer. Are you with me? Yes. Because you know that distributions and losses reduce the basis. The real answer, the correct answer here is he's worth $15,000. She's worth $15,000. The $15,000 is called the adjusted basis. Am I right? Yes. You look into the answers and $15,000 is not there. You're in NASDAQ. And now you're rocked. Are you listening to me? Yes. Now, you know it's 15000 Am I right? Yes. They're dying for you to go to that response. They want you to go to that response terribly. They put it here, and they put it right there, right in front of you. Are you with me so far? Yes. It says fifteen, but it's not $15,000. What does that answer mathematically? Negative $15,000. And why could that answer never apply? Because you can't have a negative basis. And why can't you have a negative basis? Because of the concept of limited liability. Now, you can lose 30. You basically get reduced down to zero, but you can't go below zero. Am I right? Yes. Because of the concept of limited liability, negative 15,000 is out. Any negative basis is out. Am I right? Yes. So that's out. Look at this. Losses and distributions don't adjust the basis upward. Financially, what's the maximum that you are at risk in any program? Your original basis, which is 30. But that's not the adjusted basis, which is what the question seeks. So you have me so far? Yes. The adjusted basis is 15. The original basis is 30. That's out. And now you're left with that response. Are you with me? Yes. You have any idea how difficult it is to respond none on NASDAQ? You know what none makes you think you do? None makes you go insane. None, none makes you say things to yourself like, how could it be none? It can't be none. I have to add it in my mind. I didn't, I didn't read this correctly. Sometimes, not more often than not, none is there, which is the best selection out of all four choices because the correct response may not be there. Are you with me so far? Yes. It's a very disturbing choice to select, but sometimes you are required to select it. You go with your conviction when you know the regulation, and the answer to this is none. The purpose of this is to understand the distortion of the psychological effect that Roman numeral has on a question where the question may be straightforward, but the answer is the lying and waiting. Are you with me so far? Yes. And that's NASDAQ. And that's just the beginning. And this is today. Now it's a 15 minute break. Now it's a lunchtime. When you come back, I want to give you some words of advice. We are into strategy week now. You see the differences right away. We're going after numerous numbers of questions and areas of regulation on NASDAQ. And I am not going into an orientation on margin. Are you with me so far? I am going heavy into the long and the short side of margin trading. This is strategy week. And if you're not prepared, I suggest you leave. Because when you come back, if you're not prepared, I'm going to step right over you. You either come with me on this or I'm going to roll right over. You. This is the seven now. This is strategy week. Martin, chapter 13, long on the short side, leverage transactions. I'll see you in 15. And don't abuse the break. Thank you.